introduction. I'll try to live up to it. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, my advisors. My first semester advisor, Natasha Sae, who's not here, but she indulged me very much when I transitioned from other colors to English. Um, and then Jen Bourbon, who, uh, believe it or not, taught me how to read poetry out loud. Um, and uh, Jody, who made a translator out of me. And uh, finally, David, who made the process of writing less agonizing. <laughs> I'm going to read an epigraph from the manuscript I have. It's uh, from Giacomo Leopardi's Finito. Il naufragar mi è dolce in questo mare, and the drowning is sweet in the sea. And I'll read a second one which I thought really envelops what this manuscript meant for me, and uh, I was searching for it, but I finally found it um, in Brendan's lecture this morning, actually. He said, poetry should not make you want to pull your hair out, and yet it does. <laughs> Blood disparities. My sister, not the weird artist who drew me with a hammer soaring over my forehead, but the one who's trying to become a doctor. She said that understanding biology and chemistry will help me understand lives and perhaps save them. She said if I looked at the intimacy shared between the small and large intestines, crawling comfortably with each other in sprawling heated caves, I would understand what it meant to be together and alone at the same time. She said if I witnessed autopsies of lab cats, murder rats, I would understand the devotion and dedication of red blood cells scurrying and flinching to sink into our veins, or if I fathomed the duplicity of the different colors of blood, Raspberry blood, strawberry blood, teasing gums blood, bloody hell blood. I can make poetry and conceive words like anaphylaxis and C6H12O6, pretending to understand concocted word lives when all I can see is the flesh and the wound within the flesh and the semen blood and the chestnut crust. Um, this poem is about, well, I won't tell you what it is about. <laughs> <coughs> Polka dot dreams. These dreams are not real. They are not. They are not. See how they travel with the kiss of a dead soul in the lost elm of the next door neighbor. That boy in the blue suit does not know who he is, and his dreams tell him, you are the boy in the blue suit. But he changes colors at night. He becomes coral vespasian full of warming jingles. But the dreams are not real. Like the mother who dreams of vivid springs and never-ending autumns, the oranges and the berry blown flaking with the snow, she sees every shade of her olives and grapes. If she wakes up, she is colored blind. These dreams are not real. The polka dots are not real. They are missing a spot, a life, and a tangled masterpiece. These dreams that coagulate in the old man's throat and descend in the tumor of the little he loved so much. He was thinking of donating his. Why not? But he cannot, he cannot. So be careful with these dreams. They are not real. They are not here, they are in motion. They travel between the tumor of the coral lines of midnight flavors. They quarrel with white hyenas and stormy bee queens. These dreams are not real. They travel and lurch of dead souls and blue corals and viscid leaves and empty dots and vapid livers and drunken bees and hyenas. These dreams are not real. They are not. You are not. She says they come at night, like diligent thieves, quick and quiet. They take things, small, small things, tuck them deep into their pocket, roll them like socks, cup their palms against the worn cloth to feel certainty. How do they know? They lurk, each home has its own devil. They smell, sucked air, thin air, empty air. They probe, curb swallows, thickening fear. I say they must come at night. She says they do. I say I already hear them, their footsteps a faint forking of carpet hairs. She says their silence is deafening, but I do hear them. She says there is no quietness in me. I think that's a good thing. 
Firstborn sons were killed on a quiet night, like any other. I say diligent thieves get only what they came for. She says they do. The ones rattling as if they were discomforted, <coughs> as if they did not belong there. Quick and quiet, taken like small things, small, small things, lulled and rolled. <coughs> this one is a longer, longer poem. I'm going to be reading a specific section. And this poem is about different characters, um, both real and imagined, who at some point um, in their life have contemplated um, suicide. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> On cremation. When would you like to die? It is a simple question. If you knew, would you hide? If you didn't, would you worry? Would you choose how? Old age, great illness, to die in your sleep. Would you still love? How much of yourself would you give? Would you still have the courage to wake every morning? Would you rather not? When would you like to die? Gail says she bought the plot a long time ago. Not when she discovered of her illness, which didn't quite change things, but sh which did somehow. But when she fell in love, here, dear, she said, here is where we'll be in a few years, and that if we're lucky, lying skull to skull, our bony fingers carving the soil. Our teeth will look terrible. He says, I am sure your hair will fall first. Here, my love, my hair, your hair. Would you choose how? There are so many different ways to do it. Margot handles her clientele professionally. She lights a cigarette, blows circles of winds, and frolics her hair. The pillow, of course. Lipstick smeared whispers. And the pillow. She lights another furious gestures. The wrists, I remind her, and tall buildings. Too bloody too messy. What if I survive both? Yes, what if? It is a simple question. Esmeralda unties her shoes one more time, nodding gray strings over and over again. <coughs> 